Hello, I am Claire Monley and I'm an actor and a writer. Um, I graduated from the Gailey School of Acting in 2011 and I've been working away uh, as a job and actor and also making my own work kind of ever since. And Claire, before that, was it kind of always something that you wanted to do? Was it kind of, you know, when you were younger? Yeah, yeah. I started, um, I did a lot of activities as a kid. I had like an activity every day after school and at weekends and summer courses back to back. Um, and I did everything, every kind of sport, every kind of instrument, every kind of everything. Um, none of which I was particularly good at, not a sporty kid. And then when I was eight, I started going to drama classes um, and just found my thing, the thing that I was good at. Um, and in the following years, I suppose, all the other activities kind of fell away and my focus um, kind of became solely on, on drama. And I was in an amazing, amazing drama school in Churchtown called the Irish Children's Theatre Group with an incredible teacher called Maeve Widger. And lots of us actually in the industry now have come through there. Um, she was incredible. She really... She really worked it like a little work in theatre, even though we were all tiny kids. <laughs> so she really drilled into us the discipline required. And I loved a few rules and a bit of um, people pleasing. So it suited me down to the ground. Um, and then when I was 16, I went to the Gaily School of Acting and I was part of their youth theatre company uh, run by Tara, the amazing Tara Derrington. Um, and a lot of us, again, are working in the industry now. Nairi Jürgen Harsing was there. James O'Driscoll, Uncle Kenny, lots of us work in the industry in various forms now. Um, and so I always wanted to do it. And then I wanted to go and do the full-time course in the Gaiety after school. And my folks were like, <laughs> get a degree. Um, which I did. I got myself a very useful degree in sociology and modern Irish. Um, and was part of players while I was there, but not like a, an integral part. I think it it kind of intimidated me a little bit. Like I did shows and I made friends there for sure, but I, I didn't get like full, fully into it, I suppose, in the way people do. Um, and in fourth year, I had a bit of a, um, like a early, early life crisis of being like, you can't do that. Who does that for a living? Like that's not a real thing that you get to do, like that you get to do. You need to cop on now and, and go and trade, train to be like a nurse or a lawyer or something normal. Um, and so after college, I went and got a real job. Uh, went and travelled around the world and when I came back I just felt like I had to give it a go like that if I didn't I felt like right I'll go and I'll I'll apply for drama school and if I get in I'll do it and then if it all goes awry then at least I'll have tried I suppose because mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I did the real job thing for like two years um, and and I hated it and I wanted to to be doing something completely different. I knew, I could feel it in me that it wasn't my place, I suppose. I didn't find my tribe there the way I had when I was doing um, drama as a kid. Uh, and so then I went to the Gaelic School of Acting and trained, and the rest is history. Well, the rest is present tense. <laughs> yeah, and ongoing. And like, what, what, what is that space for you, Claire? Like when you said, it didn't feel like something that you wanted to do or it didn't feel like your tribe. Or, is it, is it, can you put words on that or is it kind of... Um, look, I know, I, I know lo loads of people do jobs that like are a means to an end and you know, not everybody is passionate about the work they do and that's completely fine. And sometimes I kind of envy that to some degree, like being able to drop your job at 5 p.m. and go home and forget about it for the evening or whatever. Um, because I think we carry our work with us at all times um, in a great way and sometimes in, in a not so great way. But um, I think when I went to drama school and I started hanging out with people who were as passionate about this thing as I was, it's like it's like anything, isn't it? Like when you find the people, you don't feel like a weirdo anymore. You don't feel like... It also made it feel possible to me. Like I've always been a grafter and I've always been like goal oriented and and in some ways in some ways that's great in this line of work in some ways it's bad because you you can work and work and work and not always get the um outcome that you want you know whereas in the jobs I was in say before I went to drama school there was a clear path for me 
you know, if I got my head down, if I worked hard, like I, I would get this promotion and then this promotion, and this promotion. And in some ways, that suit that suits my personality, but in other ways, it doesn't at all because the thought of being there and doing that same thing for the rest of my life was kind of crippling. <laughs> um, and so I, when I when I went to drama school and found the people who wanted this as much as I wanted it, I thought it made it feel real. It made it feel like a viable option, like not a sensible one, but like a, a feasible, as in, as in it made me feel like I could do it, that it, it wasn't something that was reserved for, you know, people who were different from me. Yeah. Um, it made it feel accessible to me in a way that it hadn't before. And it also, I suppose the beauty of drama school is that it makes, drama school makes you feel like a hard, like hard work and graft will have a positive outcome even though we know that isn't always the case when you get out of the industry, but at least that's bred into you that if you work really, 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 really hard on your craft, on yourself, um, that you will get the outcome that, that you want from it. And then you leave and you go, oh, that's not the case at all. <laughs> yeah. well, sort of on, on that, there's two things there that, that are interesting that you kind of brought up about the kind of work ethic and the grafting, but also mm -hmm. about, you know, um, a lot of conversations I'm having are around people who have, you know, their peers who aren't necessarily within the arts and the difficulty sometimes of accepting and being yourself within the career that you have, within the lifestyle that you have, and the difficulty of trying to explain that to, some, to somebody else, to, to explain that it's not that pattern. And is there a difficulty in that, do you think? Yeah, completely. Like, I'm extremely lucky with my family and friends are all, you know, super, super supportive of the work that I do. They're my biggest fans and Aaron's biggest fans come to everything that we do. They're, they're amazing. And they definitely, um, understand, like make the effort to understand it in as far as they can. But in some ways it's just, you can't, and like, and someone, I think someone said it to us when we were in drama school and I can't even remember who it was at the time. Um, is you can't know it till you live it like anybody's life really. And for all the preparation you do in drama school for getting out, <clears throat> you can't really know um, the, the challenges the industry will pose for you as a person until you get out into it. Um, and now I've forgotten your question. No, no, no. That, that, that was the question. It was about like the, the, the conversation, say, with people. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, look, we, we, we all have like the, the stories of like, um, would you not get a job on that love hate and that kind of crack which is and, and the thing is I suppose I sometimes liken myself to a professional football player in that um, not everybody can do what we do but everybody's an expert on it at the same time because they consume <laughs> what we do you know like um, because people go to the cinema and they watch Netflix and they go to the theatre and they can be really really passionate about film and TV and stage and and so and like that's 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 exactly why we make art is is for an audience and to engage in a conversation with an audience it just isn't always ideal when you get the feedback immediately after you come off stage and the foyer of a day there from somebody you don't know. But um but I suppose that's kind of the that's the 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 way we put ourselves out into the world you have to I don't know, expect a, a some level of that. And has, has, have things like from the time, say, when you were younger and in college and now kind of in, in your career, has, like, do you still kind of look at what you, you do and kind of get nervous about it? Or do you, I mean, I don't mean for a career, but like in relation to just where, where you are and what you want to achieve? Oh, yeah, it's, it's consistently terrifying. And how, All the time. And that, well, that, what, what, what interests me about that is, you know, how does how that combated through the work? How, how does that, what's it? Well, like the, uh, the work is the easy part in one way. It's the not, the not working is the hard part. Like the work is, is why we do what we do and it's what we're good at, sort of passionate about. Um, it's, it's, it's what we put all our sweat, blood and tears in just for however long we've been in the industry. So that part is like a joy 99% of the time. The difficulty is the not working part. Yeah. Like I, I, like I've said, I'm, I'm, I'm a grafter. I like working hard. I like getting up and I like getting up early in the morning. Hey. Um, and um, I like having a reason to do that. And even, even now in, in the, 
the situation that we're all in right now, like I, I've tried to maintain a kind of a schedule and I'm trying to work on things, you know, to keep creative and to keep working, even though, you know, a lot of my work's been pulled, unfortunately, because of the situation. But I'm, the work is the easy part. It's, it's the not working is the hard part. Yeah. And I suppose for yourself, you know, over the course of your career, you know, obviously you've been on stage, you've kind of appeared on screen. And in the last number of years, you kind of have started to carve out a fantastic career for yourself as a playwright. I mean, obviously the art forms are, are different, but like from say acting to playwriting, like, you know, what was your urge there for you, Claire? Oh, you're gone. Oh, flip. Hang yeah. on. Am I back? Yeah. Great. Um, I suppose like, I've never, I've never um, lied about the fact that the reason I started writing was out of pure frustration. Um, with not getting as much work as I wanted to be, which we're not working all the time. And so you come out of drama school with this drive and this energy to, you've been doing this thing that you love like 50 hours a week for two solid years and you come out ready, you come out flying and like you come out on fire, ready to go into the industry, ready to work, ready to be, you know, up early every morning doing the thing that you love and then nothing. And it's just, it's like you fall off a cliff. You're like, where do I put all this energy and this, drive that I've built up um, and that was why I started writing it was more of, it was kind of a distraction it was more of my mental health than anything that I needed somewhere to put all this energy and um, you know if, if I wasn't being employed as an actor to tell stories and I had to find another way to tell stories that's what we all are whether you're an actor or a writer or a designer like we're all storytellers in our own way um, and so I needed somewhere to put that energy into and that's when I started writing Charlie and um, and, and honestly, if it, if it hadn't been for the the kind of the support and um, the encouragement and the like slight bullying of people like Ashley O'Brien and Ruth McGowan in the Fringe, um, Seamus O'Rourke who made me perform a, a part of it up in Carrigallen, um, Kleena and Quiva of of now seen and heard then collaborations, uh, and of you guys in Axis, I wouldn't ever have gotten that play to a stage because it, it would have been too scary, mm. I suppose. Um, but the way things fell, it, it did happen. And like that, it, like it wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't have, mm. I would have been too terrified to put myself in that situation. I had to kind of be pushed into it a little bit. But I'm so glad that I was. And, and it's opened up a whole other avenue for me. Yeah, and that, that, that's kind of what, what's interesting, because obviously having, it's like, you know, like a musician writing their first album, they kind of, you know, they get all their life and their work into their first album and then they get a bit of success with that and have to go write another album. But I mean, you know, that that's something that you've gone through well, second and third and cause like fourth album in, in the last kind of couple of years. Yeah. Has that been very different than the chart? Um, yeah, very much so. And I think when I started writing, um, and like it took me a long time to even call myself a writer, Neve. And if we were in access, had to like, like bully me into calling myself a writer because I found that quite difficult. I felt like an imposter. Like I had imposter syndrome. I still do. I, I don't know if that ever goes away. I will always feel it to some degree. But um, so I started asking every writer who I met what their process was in the thoughts that I could um, rob one for myself because Charlie happened kind of the, the beginnings of the writings of, I can't even remember how I wrote Charlie. And, and actually, and Marco Rowe said um, that at the beginning of every new project, you forget how you wrote every one that went before, which was somewhat um, encouraging and somewhat terrifying. Okay. But um, So I tried to like rob other people's processes because I didn't have one. And I felt this need, like as a person who kind of relies heavily on structure and routine, um, I didn't have a process. I didn't know how to start writing the next one. And so, but then of course, because of the generosity and uh, and passion for the arts of Tile Style and Business to Arts, I was awarded a bursary to write the second one. And so again, <laughs> I had to. <laughs> um, and actually, and I started writing a play about body image um, and I wrote 20 pages of it and it was awful. Like it was, it was terrible. Um, and I spent like, I was obviously I'd gotten this bursary. So I was kind of paying myself for the days I was writing and everything. So I had this overwhelming guilt of like, I've gotten this bursary and clearly I'm not a writer. Like that was a fluke. 
I did it once, I can't do it again. Um, and and Aaron, who who works with me a lot on my plays, kept asking to read it. And he knew something was up because normally if I write a page that's half decent, I'm like, read it, read it, it's great. Um, and I wouldn't let him read it. And finally I just said, look, it's crap. It's it's rubbish. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm like, It's terrible. And he was like, throw it away and start again. I said, I can't, I can't. There's someone's paying me. And they were, and he was like, that's what they're paying you for. Like, that's the point. That's the whole point. And so I did. I ditched it. Uh, I completely started from scratch. I didn't have any issues in mind. And I think that was the problem is that I came at it from the perspective of an issue. And so it was just so didactic and on the nose and just crap. Um, and that's not what I would like to see. That's not what I'd like to experience. I don't like to be told how to think or feel in the theatre. I like to have to work a bit harder. Um, and so then I started writing Minefield. And again, I did, didn't have any issues in mind at the time whatsoever. I started writing this straight up two strangers meeting on a park bench play. Uh, and then shit got dark. Um, but that was a way more uh, natural process for me than, than coming at it from the perspective of an issue, which I did originally and just didn't work. Yeah. Um, and then even the two I've written since, again, have come from totally different impulses. Uh, like Charlie, the impulse for Charlie came from a voice, from her voice, hearing her voice really clearly in my head. Um, the impulse for Minefield was just two strangers meeting and, and what that relationship could develop into. Um, the third play, The Shed, is like, is kind of it began as kind of a love letter to my friends my friends from home and it's just turned into something much bigger and 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 kind of more epic than that but still at, at its heart a love letter to women I suppose um um the fourth play a uh, funny story um kind of was inspired by getting married and immediately being asked when I was going to have a baby um yeah, so like, so all the impulses come from different places, and and then as a result, the process is different every time. Uh, and so I feel like I, I will be like Marco Rowe when I go to write the next one. I'll sit down and, and and I'll feel like I've never done it before, and that every other one was a fluke. And the process of ha handing it over, the process of giving it to someone to read, has that got easier, harder, same? Um, I think I I think when I wrote Charlie, I would have handed would have handed it to and this isn't to anyone who would read it for me. Um, and I would have taken all their feedback on board and I would have assumed that they knew more than me and I would have tried to implement every note from every person who read it. And I think what I've learned since then is that's mad. <laughs> um, and that you have to keep your circle small. Um, you have to only hand your work, especially your unfinished work, over to people who you trust um, people who you know share um, a kind of a vision with you or at least have an understanding of your voice. Um, and I've been so, so lucky since I started writing that I've developed a relationship with Axis, with yourself and Neve, that I work with Aaron, that I've worked with Pamela McQueen, that I've worked with Rebecca Mayers and the Lyric and all, and, and I've built up a, a kind of a incredible team of people who I trust who I can go to designers Susie Cummins and Naomi Faulkner and uh, Alan Kirk all these, all these amazing people I've worked with since then who I would trust to hand my work over to who I who I know will care about it as much as I do yeah can I ask you then going back to you as an actor um, see and I saw you many times on stage before we kind of got to work together and I'm kind of just I'm interested talking to actors about kind of does it, does your process change for each show I mean like you know obviously when you approach a different part in a different play does it depend on the team around you the director and um, the situation or is there a clear monolith way of internally approaching things um I think there's a I mean there's a read play you just read the play and read the play and then read the play again and um uh, if it's a specific a time period or era or topic or something that I don't know a lot about, I'll obviously do my due diligence and do my research on on it so I have a sense of the time or the place or the event or whatever it is. Like I read an entire book about rugby before I did Lone Stands. I still am entirely sure how rugby works, but I, I gave it a good go. Um, but then I'm very, 
I think as an actor, I'm very much led by a director. I think I go into a room, um, you know, knowing that each each director's process will be different, each room will be different, each ensemble will be different. Um, and I'd like to think that I am flexible and malleable to all those things. Um, especially in terms of working with a director, because I've worked with so many different directors in my career, in my, over my career, and like and brilliant directors. Um, but every room is different. Um, and I think if you if you go in with such rigid ideas about how it is that you like to work, then you don't, you know, or for me, I, I would feel like I wasn't even the space to let everybody else in the room in, in terms of your other castmates and the designers and, and the whole team of people who make a play happen. Um, so yeah, I think again, like the writing, I think every process is different. Okay. Um, and, and, and if you have a great director, then it's led by a great director. Okay, a couple more questions and then I'll, I'll let you go. Um, is there, or has there been an event or a piece of art or a show or a film or something or a number of them in your life that either you go back to as a touchstone or that completely kind of knocked you sideways? Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I put my hands up to let an element of bias in this, but Drew Murphy, um, when Drew did the Tom Murphy cycle, I remember seeing it all in the one day in the town hall in Galway and just being totally mind blown by it. Just the, the epicness of the endeavour and um, the beauty of Tom's writing, um, the ability he has to say so much while saying nothing at all. Um, I think that's something that I've really, really, really strive to emulate in my right, even though of course we from different times and entirely different subject matter and all those things, but in terms of his storytelling, um I just remember remember watching the whistle in the dark, like and nearly holding my breath the whole way through it because the tension that was created and the and the horror of it all and it was just yeah, it was epic and it was, it reminded me, and not that, like, I've had a, a million, so many experiences like that in the theatre where you're just reminded of, of how important live art is and how, and how genuinely life-shifting it can be, um, or thought-shifting or mind-shifting in some ways, um, but that, that just sticks out in my mind, um, and and as well, cause my, as well, my mother was sitting behind me at the time, and after we watched, I think it was Conversations was the first play, and we watched Conversations, and she leaned forward to me and went, "Yeah, he's very good, isn't he?" <laughs> About Aaron, so that was kind of a stamp of approval there. I thought, um, so that's that's pretty memorable for me too. <laughs> and sorry, finally, Claire, um, a lot of things have been kind of open conversation around like not just on, on this series but when I've been kind of talking to people generally I'm always struck by the people that get voices or get voices amplified um in our sector or kind of get you know I'm, I'm obviously social media you, I'm, you connect, always connect to loads and loads of people and you can hear what people are saying and something that's it's really interesting but they mightn't have the platform or the you know that it's so I'm, I'm really interested in how we as a sector communicate more with the general public about what we do because I just feel sometimes we're, we're missing a trick that we kind of end up talking to ourselves and totally. I, like how would you like do you have any advice on that <laughs> uh, I don't know if I I don't know if I have um an answer to the problem but I do one of the things that's always in the forefront of my mind whenever I'm writing is that theatre is for everybody um like for everyone, not just for us, not for our little bubble of people. Um, it's really important to me that anyone who comes in to see the work that I make can connect with it on some level and isn't made to feel excluded in any way, which is why I brought, my dad is 76 and um, obviously Minefield ended up being a, a lot about online shaming um, and our interactions with the internet in, in, in all those, uh, on all those levels. Um, and so I brought my dad to every reading that we had. Um, because even though 
he mightn't have been my target audience, even though I kind of hate that that yeah. idea of a target audience. But um, I wanted to make sure that he that he got it, that he wasn't lost, that he wouldn't walk in and sit down in the theatre and start watching that play and at some point tune out or feel like it wasn't for him or that we weren't speaking to him. Um, I think it's so, so, so important that nobody is made to feel stupid or not a part of something in the theatre because it should be accessible to everybody. That's not to say that it shouldn't be challenging. Yeah. It just, it just should be accessible to everybody. Uh, and I, I, like, I don't know what the answer is to that. I mean, I think the free first previews were an absolutely genius idea. Um, like, from a marketing perspective, in terms of getting the word out on the street that the Abbey is there, for people who don't know, because there's plenty of people who don't. Um, and just getting people into the building who haven't been there before and showing them that theatre isn't, doesn't have to be exclusionary or exclusive or for a certain type of person. Um, I think my mom brought me to the theatre from when I was really, really young. We were always, always going to play. So it never felt like that to me. It always felt like a place I could be and and access. But I know that isn't the case for everybody. And, and it makes me sad. Like, And I've always said, to, whenever I send my, my pals to a play and they come out and they look a bit bewildered, I'm like, if, I'm like, if you were lost, that's not your problem. That's our problem. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you felt like they weren't speaking to you or it was going over your head or it was going, you know, around you in some way, then that's not your problem, that's ours. And Claire, um, sorry, in, in relation to, say, uh, the independent artist or the musician or the techie, you know, at, at this time that we're all living through is, you know, it's very challenging, obviously, because a lot of work has been, you know, I saw your kind of post about mid-rehearsal kind of being whipped out of that process must have been extraordinarily difficult. Mm. But now that everyone's in this kind of bubble, I'm really interested in seeing is there a way of re reframing you know, because there's so many people that are involved in this industry and I suppose part of the reasoning behind this was to kind of get people talking to each other more or sharing or sharing their kind of journeys more because we don't get to hear that an, an awful lot. Sure. I was wondering. Um, yeah. yeah, I suppose um, we, are, we are good at sharing to some degree, but also I think there's a... We want to present success as much as possible um, because we want to be seen to be doing well mm. um, and that's fine and that's and it's great to share the successes and I'm 100% guilty of this uh, you know you, you post about your opening night or you talk about you know the, the successes that you're having within your career um, and we don't talk so much about the downtimes or the you know, I think we're, we're kind of good at doing that in, in, in smaller, more contained environments. But um, but it's definitely a conversation that could, could be opened up. I mean, it's, I, think, I think around festival time last year, there was a lot of, a bit more public talk about um, burnout. Yeah. You know, going from so many of our, particularly our, say, our designers and or whatever, going straight from, maybe Kilkenny into Fringe into Theatre Festival and having this chunk of time during the year where they are going on stuff like just without a day's break because that's the time of the year where you can make money so you kind of can't turn down work whatever and I think there began a kind of a conversation around that time about burnout which is a real thing um, and I think and especially around it's so funny with everything that's going on right now there's so much encouragement online to you know make use of the time to write that play or that novel or that, you know, which is great. And I totally get that because like I said, I like a bit of structure and I like goals, you know, like ticking things off lists. But it's nice now to see the other wave coming in of, you don't have to write that novel. You don't have to write that play. If you just survive this, then that's okay too. Um, and I don't think we tell ourselves that enough in yeah. this industry. Outside of a pandemic, yeah, we yeah. don't tell ourselves that it's okay to stop and to to not work for a while and to close a laptop or to um, just mind ourselves a bit better uh, and not always be competing with each other so much. Because even though I know we're, I feel like we're an industry that mind each other in some ways really well, um, but we're, all, we're also kind of competing with each other the whole time, uh, whether we like it or not. And, and that's tiring, <laughs> it's exhausting. Claire, thanks very, very much. I'm going to leave it at that, if that's okay with you. Thanks very Fantastic. much. Fantastic. And I shall talk to you again soon. Indeed.